हेलो फ्रेंड्स दिस इज डॉक्टर राकेश मित्तल सीनियर फैकल्टी इन सर्जरी एट आकाश पीजी एंड टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस द सर्जरी क्वेश्चंस इन रिसेंटली हेल्ड नीट एग्जाम आई होप ऑल ऑफ यू हैव डन वेरी वेल सर्जरी क्वेश्चंस वर रिलेटिवली वेरी इजी ऑलमोस्ट 60 टू 70 परसेंट क्वेश्चन आई वुड कैटेगराइज एज ईजी and 20 to 25 percent from easy to medium difficulty and only one or two questions were bit tricky and uh, almost all the questions were from our main content of surgery and the question bank right so now we'll discuss them one by one the first question a patient underwent debridement surgery as shown in the given image choose the correct statement so we have to look for the correct statement what is the image as you can see it's a scrotal and surrounding area image and debridement has been done so as you can see testes are exposed penile structure you can see with the follies inside so this is all what we can see in the image let us look at the choices now first is anti gas gangrene serum should always right so that's a word you need to be focused remember it is a fornius gangrene fornius gangrene is not a single organism it's a polymicrobial mixed flora of organisms includes both aerobic as well as anaerobic anti gas gangrene is most classically useful in the gas gangrene which is caused by clostridial infections gas producing organisms so it might be needed in some cases but not always so that's not the correct statement urinary diversion is required now urinary diversion examiner means in form of the suprapubic cystostomy which is not needed because fornius is a superficial infection involving the skin and the fascias of the scrotum and the perineum and the surrounding areas right as even in the picture you can see a follies can easily be inserted because urethra is not invaded by this infection so urinary diversion is not required now bilateral orchidectomy is required testes are not involved by infection in fornius gangrene the superficial tissues have been removed by debridement it is called shameful exposure of the testes though both the testes are exposed but they are normal they don't need to be removed so it is not required it is caused by mixed flora of aerobic and an aerobic organism so that's the true statement or the correct statement okay next question is very very easy again which of the following cancers is caused by clonorchis sinensis biliary tract cancers cholangiocarcinoma to some extent gall bladder carcinoma so that's the answer hepatocellular carcinoma you know the most common cause is cirrhosis alcoholic as well as uh, post hepatitis like hepatitis b virus and c virus they are the main causes urinary bladder carcinoma smoking the chemical dyes exposure there is one parasite involved here also you know that cystosomia hematobium right gastric cancers diet smoking alcohol h pylori drugs like nsaids these are the main causes right very easy now 28 year old female patient presents with history of 28 year female young female presenting with abdominal pain weight loss all of you know weight loss mostly seen in cancers and chronic infections so these are the two causes you have to look for and sterile pyuria that's the most important clue to clinch the diagnosis sterile pyuria the most classical reason in kidney is tubercular pyelonephritis or renal tuberculosis right x ray image is given below what is the most likely diagnosis as you can see in the x ray the right kidney is opacified right it is looking white right the entire kidney not just the pelvic elishial system had there been opacity only in the pelvic elishial system the better diagnosis could have been stagon calculus but it's the entire kidney all of you know the pathogenesis of renal tuberculosis there is caseous necrosis 
the renal parenchyma is involved in the later stages. The kidney initially is filled with necrotic material which is called putty kidney which gets calcified later on that becomes a cement kidney and that is how it looks like. So, that is a classical example of putty kidney or renal tuberculosis. Right, so very easy. Okay, next, a 62 year old chronic smoker with weight loss and cough for more than one year. Biopsy reveals atypical cells, so it is favoring malignancy, some lung cancer. Patient has elevated calcium level. What is the most common cancer involved in hypercalcemia? Right, out of all the lung cancers you have studied, again, this is a marked question. It is uh, like uh, taught to all the students the paraneoplastic syndromes associated with various types of lung cancers. And all of you know, hypercalcemia is the most common paraneoplastic syndrome associated with squamous cell carcinoma. So, again, a straightforward question for you. Okay, next 40 year old alcoholic patient. So, alcoholic patient lose motions and now presents with pain in right hypochondrium with minimal hepatic abscess of 7. See, most of the questions I have observed in this exam that though there are four or five lines of uh, clinical presentation has been described, but ultimately the examiner himself has given you the diagnosis and has asked a question related to it. So, even if you cannot make something out of the history, the diagnosis has been given to you, a small hepatic abscess. Now, there are two types of hepatic abscesses, you know, amoebic or pyogenic. Again, the diagnosis has been given to you, patient has loose motions. So, you know loose motions are associated with amoebiasis. So, this is a case of amoebic liver abscess and it is small in size. What is the next best line of management? Now, pair therapy that is percutaneous aspiration, installation of scolicides and re-aspiration, that is a treatment for hydrated cyst hydrated cyst okay so that goes out medical surgical surgical management is very rarely needed for hepatic abscesses only when they are ruptured right so this is also out now percutaneous drainage and medical management these are the two choices now percutaneous drainage indications for percutaneous drainage in cases of liver abscess large abscess more than 5 6 cm in size left lobe abscess subcapsular abscess they have increased risk of rupture that's why they should be drained early by percutaneous means either by a needle aspiration or putting a pigtail now one more thing no response to the treatment medical treatment even after 3 to 5 days of drugs or the antibiotics. So, no response for 3 to 5 days, large abscess, left lobe abscess. So, these are the indications, but none of these is there in this question. So, and for amoebiasis, the best treatment is medical. You know the drug of choice, metronidazole. So, medical treatment is the initial treatment of choice for amoebic liver abscess. Percutaneous drainage is reserved for specific indications. So, answer here is medical management. So, again, easy question, easiest of all, right? Straightforward GCS calculation, Glasgow Coma score. Repeatedly, it is being taught to you, right? Examiner has given you the eye response, the verbal response, and the motor response, and you just need to fit this into GCS table and find the correct combination. So, for a, a verbal response, inappropriate words, eye response for the painful stimulus, the motor response, withdrawal, right? So, that is the GCS score table and very easy eye response to the pain. So, this is 2 for the given question, verbal response is inappropriate words. So, this becomes 3 for the given question and motor response is uh, 
withdrawal from the pain. So, this becomes 4. So, 2, 3, 4. E2, V3, M4. So, that is the correct answer. Okay, a 50 year old woman is diagnosed with breast cancer by Reds 5 stage. By Reds 5 is almost confirmed malignancy. Which of the following is a good prognostic factor? Now, prognostic factors there are hormonal receptors that decide the prognosis of the cancer and other indicators are there. All of you know the genes involved in breast cancer, BRCA1, BRCA2, breast cancer gene. BRCA1 positive tumors are typically according to the molecular classification which we always tell the students one of the most important topics in breast cancer. BRCA1 patients, they are typically triple negative. So, ER negative, PR negative and HER2 new negative. So, that is what we mean by triple negative. Now, when we talk about receptors, there are uh, one is uh, ERPR receptors, estrogen and progesterone receptors and other is HER2 new receptors. I always teach this way, ERPR are friendly receptors. This is a friend for the patient and HER2 new is an enemy. So, presence of enemy makes it bad prognosis, presence of friend makes it a better prognosis. So, P53, poor prognosis, high KI67 which is a marker of mitosis. So, higher the KI67, more is the mitosis, mitotic index. So, poor is the prognosis. So, ER positive, presence of ER receptors is a positive or good prognostic factor for breast cancers. Okay, next question, a young male patient presents with a swelling in the neck that moves up on deglutition that is swallowing and protrusion of the tongue. Again, very easy, straightforward, right? Swellings in the neck, midline of the neck, two most important you have to differentiate is between the thyroglossal cyst, which is a congenital swelling because of uh, the remnant of uh, thyroglossal duct and another is a goiter, thyroid swelling. Now, remember thyroid swelling moves only with deglutition, not with tongue. Whereas, thyroglossal cyst, since the tract is attached to the foramen cecum base of the tongue, it moves up on deglutition and also the protrusion of the tongue. So, that is a swelling, midline of the neck, answer straightforward thyroglossal cyst. So, again very easy category. Now, this is again a marked question that is a Q sofa score. A 30 year old patient is admitted in emergency after RTA. Again, the history is irrelevant. Just look at the last line. What are the factors criteria used for Q sofa score? Q sofa score includes the mental status that is Glasgow coma score, the systolic blood pressure and respiratory rate. So, that is a Q sofa score. And uh, that's from my uh, PPT, my recording on the infections. So that includes uh, three criteria: systolic blood pressure. The mnemonic I use is HART. Had H is for hypotension, low systolic blood pressure. A is for altered mental status, that is low GCS, and T is for tachypnea, where respiratory rate is higher. So that's Q so far score. Okay. Next question, a patient is operated for, has been operated for right inguinal hernia by laparoscopic technique. Now, that is the important clue here, right? He is complaining of pain in the right thigh after the surgery, which now has been got stuck in the fixator. Fixator, when we operate laparoscopically, we fix uh, the mesh using pins, titanium pins usually or tax. So, that is what is meant by fixator here. And if you go too lateral, if you remember the triangle of doom and triangle of pain in the anatomy of uh, the laparoscopic repair, particularly the extra peritoneal repair. So, there are chances of entrapment of nerves in these tacks that is fixator. Now, in the laparoscopic surgery, again this has been taught to you, the most common nerve to get entrapped is lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh and that corresponds well 
to the area of pain as well after the surgery. Femoral nerve is usually not involved. Ilioinguinal nerve is the most common nerve involved in open surgery for inguinal hernia, not laparoscopic surgery. Iliohypogastric nerve again can get injured in open surgery, but more common surgery causing injury to iliohypogastric nerve is appendicectomy. Lateral cutaneous nerve dhai is this is the answer that's most commonly involved in laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair. Okay, now next question a 58 year old male patient presents with weight loss. He is a chronic smoker, also complains of pain in right upper limb, right? Old age, weight loss, chronic smoker. So, first two lines give you an idea, we are talking about some cancer. Now, the symptoms, pain in the right upper limb and there was ptosis of the right eye. Again, see, same thing I have been saying again and again. The examiner himself has given you the diagnosis. Even if you don't see the first four lines, just the last line, right apical mass. So, x-ray showing the right apical mass with symptoms, pain and paresthesias or swelling in the right upper limb with the symptoms of ptosis. Ptosis is a, one of the symptoms of Horner syndrome that is sympathetic system involvement that is ptosis, meiosis, anhydrosis, enophthalmos and loss of spinal reflex. These are the five features of Horner syndrome. So, lung tumor, apical lung tumor, this is the site for thoracic outlet. So, it indirectly, this is one of the causes of thoracic outlet syndrome. So, compression of the brachial plexus nerves, the subclavian vein, subclavian artery and the sympathetic system. So, uh, the involvement of sympathetic system leads to Horner syndrome. The involvement of the brachial nerves uh, brachial plexus branches and the subclavian vessels can lead to pain, paresthesias and uh, swelling in the corresponding limb. So, straightforward diagnosis of Pancost tumor, so causing Pancost syndrome. So, again a marked question. Many questions, uh, they are repeat from the previous year question bank. Okay, so next 45 year old patient diagnosed with chronic Pancost. So, again the diagnosis has been given to you. It is a case of chronic pancreatitis. Admitted in emergency during further workup, second important point is duct is dilated. Pancreatic duct is dilated around 10 millimeters with calculi in sight. What is the best management? Now, when we talk about surgery in chronic pancreatitis, again this has been taught to you in details in chronic pancreatitis. There are two broad categories of surgical procedures we do depending on the presentation, the pathology. So, if the duct is dilated, usually more than 7 millimeter, then the procedure of choice is drainage procedure. If the duct is not dilated, it is narrowed and there is inflammatory mass in the pancreas. Mass in pancreas, duct not dilated. Then the surgical procedure of choice is resection procedure. Resection procedure means we resect that portion of pancreas that contains the pathology. So, resection can be of different limits. It can be a subtotal pancreatectomy or a resection of just the head of the pancreas without the duodenum, preserving the duodenum and it could be distal pancreatectomy. So, various kinds of resection procedures depending on the site of pathology. But when the duct is dilated, drainage procedure is the treatment of choice and the most convenient drainage procedure is the pancreatico jejunostomy and this is called longitudinal or lateral pancreatico jejunostomy that is also known as Pusto's procedure. Say this is the pancreas, that is the pancreatic duct. So, we open the duct longitudinally. So, this is called longitudinal, right? We take a loop of the jejunum and anastomose it 
with the jejunum so this becomes a pancreatico jejunostomy longitudinal or lateral pancreatico jejunostomy also known as very popular pustos procedure right so answer here is the pancreatico jejunostomy because duct here is clearly dilated more than 7 mm okay next question again very very easy question 22 year old medical student presents with exophthalmos palpitations and heat intolerance it's a triad of the graves disease or hyperthyroidism palpitations heat intolerance are symptoms of hyperthyroidism exophthalmos you know one of the common eye signs associated with hyperthyroidism in graves disease now what antibodies you know which antibodies are elevated in graves disease they are called lats long acting thyroid stimulators they are igg antibodies against the tsh receptors they are not inhibitory they are stimulatory anti tsh receptors antibodies and that's why they cause hyperthyroidism anti tpo anti thyroglobulin these are more commonly seen in hashimotos thyroiditis particularly anti tpo is the most common and there they cause reverse effect destruction of thyroid leading on to ultimately hypothyroidism right so the answer here is the anti tsh receptor antibodies this is again a repeat question last year it was asked in different form cap classification right again a marked question one of the easiest questions again like gcs ko so they have asked the cap category of varicose veins varicose veins with eczema so it's c4a right so that's a cap classification clinical cap stands for clinical etiological anatomical and pathophysiological so clinical classification c0 when there are no signs of varicose veins c1 is when they are very small minute veins which are described as telangiectasia or dermal flares or reticular veins c2 is properly found varicose veins c3 is varicose veins with edema c4 now the skin changes start c4a is the earlier skin changes either pigmentation or eczema that has been asked in this question or malleolar flare and c4b is further advanced skin changes in form of lipodermatosclerosis or atrophy blanch C5, C6 are venous ulcers. C5 is healed venous ulcer, and C6 is active venous ulcer. Okay. Now next question is about the penile cancer. A 55-year-old male presented with a mass on the glans penis. So that's the first point. Even in the picture, you can see the mass was around three centimeters. So that gives you a hint. It's a big mass. there were no enlarged lymph nodes so no lymph nodes clinically involved the tumor was diagnosed so again see everything is wasted they have given you the diagnosis varicose carcinoma now varicose carcinoma is also known as bushke lowenstein tumor it's a squamous cell carcinoma right which is locally aggressive varicose carcinoma is locally aggressive cancer squamous cell carcinoma also known as bushke lowenstein tumor it doesn't it's locally malignant doesn't spread like other squamous cell cancer so doesn't involve lymph nodes usually so th that's given it to you in the question as well no and large lymph nodes so fits well with the nature of varicose carcinoma an examiner has asked you the treatment of choice now the co2 laser ablation the topical 5 fluoro uracil these are the treatment initial treatment used for very small carcinoma in c2 for squamous cell carcinoma in c2 we can use topical 5 fluoro uracil or laser ablation or carbon dioxide ablation but they are not the treatment for full blown cancer topical podophyllin all of you know podophyllin is useful for warts not for squamous cell cancer again so automatically even if you don't remember the answer by exclusion of the other choices you will reach the answer surgery is the treatment of choice and since the tumor is at the glans so partial penectomy 
is the treatment of choice, surgical procedure of choice for this patient. Okay, next question. This one is slightly tricky. So, one or two questions as I told you in the beginning, they might be tricky for you. A child presents with pale stools and jaundice. So, let us see the clues, how we reach the diagnosis. Pale stools with jaundice. What kind of jaundice it is? You know, pale stools is a feature of stercobilinogen that is seen in obstructive jaundice. So, this is conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. Investigation, so bilirubin obviously will be elevated because the patient already has jaundice. It's a child. So, you start thinking in form of neonatal jaundice or childhood jaundice. ALP is elevated slightly, raised AFP. The liver enzymes, AST and ALT are normal. Now, this is the most important clue for the diagnosis, the liver biopsy shows duct proliferation with duct dilatation with collection in the bile ducts and biliary plug. This is the characteristic feature seen in extrahepatic biliary atresia. So, that is the answer here. Extrahepatic biliary atresia, the characteristic liver biopsy features, which is one of the main diagnostic investigations for biliary atresia and child presenting with the obstructive jaundice, right? Krigler Nazar is more of unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. Dubin Johnson is mixed, both uh, direct as well as indirect. Rotus is more of the direct again, but the biopsy features won't be the same. So, again, straightforward diagnosis, just a little application of the knowledge will take you to the correct answer. This is again easiest of all, again in the same category like GCS and CAP classification. In which layer of the abdominal wall the marked opening is present? The picture has been given to you, that is a right sided inguinal canal, that is a deep ring, that is a superficial ring or external ring, that is inguinal canal. So, marker has been put on the deep ring. So, you know that deep ring is present in fascia transversalis. So, that is the answer here. Deep ring is situated in fascia transversalis. It is an oval opening half inch above the mid inguinal point, whereas superficial ring is a triangular opening in the external oblique aponeurosis and uh, it is uh, approximately 1 centimeter above and lateral to the pubic tubercle. Okay. Now, a 55 year old alcoholic patient presented. So, old age alcoholic presented with weight loss. So, these three features are leading us to some cancer, right? Most likely, let us see. Okay. So, on investigations, alpha fetoproteins and alkalis phosphatase were raised with normal ALT AST. Straightforward diagnosis hepatocellular carcinoma. Let me tell you how. Hepatocellular carcinoma, the liver functions or liver enzymes are mostly normal. The jaundice is very, very late. Only when either 70 to 80 percent of liver has been damaged, has been uh, engulfed by the tumor or some major bile duct obstruction because of the tumor. Till that time, the ALT, AST are normal. AFP, you know, it is a tumor marker for hepatocellular carcinoma, old age presenting with weight loss, with a history of alcoholism. So, straightforward diagnosis. Cholangiocarcinoma, patient will have deranged enzymes, AFP will not be elevated. Okay. Hepatic adenoma can have similar presentation, but not much weight loss plus hepatic adenoma is a hormone driven tumor mostly seen in the females of reproductive age group and it has a strong link with oral contraceptives. Alcoholic hepatitis again will not have normal ALT ASE, they will be deranged. Okay. So, the answer here is hepatocellular carcinoma. Okay, a 5 year old child presented with bleeding per rectum in children, bleeding per rectum, a very common cause, one the anal fissure, second the rectal polyp. Okay, 
diagnosis again has been given to you a rectal polyp on examination biopsy shows dilated glands with presence of mucin what is the most likely cause the child presenting with bleeding per rectum with a polyp with this kind of histological feature this shows you a case of juvenile polyposis and juvenile polyps what kind of polyps they are they are hamartomatous polyps so that's the answer again relatively easy so it's a mixed histology that's what hamartoma is right choristoma is it involves heterotopic tissues adenoma and carcinoma that doesn't match with the given age and the given picture so the best answer the obvious answer here is hamartoma okay a patient with previous surgical history following trauma to the chest 5 years ago this is the appearance of the chest now what is the cause again a simple direct image based question spot diagnosis as you can see here overgrown scar tissue scar tissue growing beyond the margins of the wound this is a typical picture seen in keloid the area chest presternal area you know that's a common site for keloids the excessive scar tissue with the history of trauma and the classical picture so everything fits in keloid right okay again a marked question based on ulcers a diabetic patient that's the biggest clue the common type of ulcers on the plantar surface of the foot seen in diabetics they are pressure ulcers or trophic ulcers presenting with callosities which is a feature of diabetic neuropathy and the condition given below so ulcer on the great toe with punched out margins punched out edges classically it's a trophic ulcer right doesn't fit into venous arterial or malignant ulcer okay a patient came to the emergency after accidentally consuming sodium hydroxide so it's a so corrosive injury of esophagus again we teach in the esophagus the effects of corrosives in the esophagus and uh, what we are supposed to do if the patient has this so patient is having dysphagia so what is the treatment so we have to look for the palliation of dysphagia right patient has consumed sodium hydroxide so that's the esophagus so the site of injury is somewhere in the esophagus so we have to make way for the feeding right let's see the choices esophagojejunostomy so bypassing the esophagus to the jejunum okay so that can be done but it's a technically complex procedure lengthy procedure and extensive procedure why unnecessarily compromise the anatomy of esophagus when we have the other simple procedures now feeding jejunostomy that's the answer here feeding jejunostomy all of you know that's the best thing initial there's a best palliative surgical procedure remember surgical procedure particularly for corrosive injuries of the esophagus so just put feeding tube in the jejunum this is a very simple procedure easy procedure can be done in 10 15 minutes can be done in local anesthesia so you don't need to open the full abdomen don't need to open the chest so much simpler compared to esophagojejunostomy so that's the treatment of choice gastrojejunostomy no way because gastrojejunostomy is beyond the area of obstruction in the esophagus so no way it's going to help esophageal stenting though it stenting is one of the best choices for other causes of dysphagia in the esophagus like esophageal cancers you can stent the esophagus right but it is a case of corrosive injury so esophagus will be inflamed from inside and friable so if you try to do a stenting that can lead to esophageal perforation so stenting is out so best choice here to palliate dysphagia is feeding jejunostomy let the injuries heal till that time you have already made way for feeding the patient 
and once it heals completely then reassess the patient how much stricture has developed accordingly then decide the final treatment for the patient okay another question from the infections okay one the first one we discussed the fornius gangrene another one melanies gangrene and one q so far okay so lots of questions from the chapter so a patient presented with following appearance straightforward uh, picture it's a necrotizing gangrene of the anterior abdominal wall known as the melanies gangrene so incorrect condition incorrect statement we have to find out okay so this is a typical case of melanies gangrene okay initially streptococcal later becomes polymicrobial okay that's true extensive debridement every 24 hours this is true hyperbaric oxygen is not useful this is the false statement hyperbaric oxygen is one of the treatment options for majority of gangrenes particularly the infective forms of gangrene right so hyperbaric oxygen is very useful okay so this is the wrong statement again very easy a patient presented with history of fall one week back on ct the following image was seen what is the diagnosis so that's the hematoma classical lens shaped lenticular hematoma the biconvex hematoma which is seen in edh so that's the answer in sdh you know it's a concave or convex so this is the type of hematoma what we see in sdh okay a male patient presents with a firm swelling in the area shown in the picture what is the most likely diagnosis now remember any swelling in the parotid region is considered taken as a parotid mass unless proved otherwise so that's the parotid region so swelling in this area this is a straightforward diagnosis again image based spot diagnosis it's a nothing but a parotid tumor okay now next question a patient underwent abdominal perineal resection for rectal cancer the most common complication of vessels ligation during this surgery would be now this is the most tricky question out of all we have discussed all were relatively easy or medium difficulty one or two but this is the question which uh, personally i think is not a ug level question though we discuss these things we discuss the technical aspects surgical aspects of the rectal resections abdominal perineal resection low anterior resection and the nerve injuries particularly when we are doing the mesorectal excision you know it's surrounded by the sympathetic nerves the parasympathetic plexus the, the superior inferior hypogastric plexus hypogastric nerves and those can get damaged during the surgery and we discuss the complications also all kinds of the sexual dysfunctions the urinary dysfunctions that can happen but the choices i had the problem with the choices which the examiner has made right but still let's see without looking at the choices let us first see what are the complications of the nerve injuries during the vessel ligation during apr there are two components sympathetic and parasympathetic two components of autonomic nervous system now the two most important things you need to remember one is bladder and second is sexual dysfunction now sympathetic system since it uh, innervates the internal urethral sphincter bladder neck internal urethral sphincter so that function is gone that leads to retrograde ejaculation retrograde ejaculation so that's a feature of sympathetic injury whereas parasympathetic you know the most important function is it supplies detrusor of the bladder so contractility of the detrusor is dependent on parasympathetic so bladder contractility will be reduced when the parasympathetic system is damaged also the importance because of erection failure of the penis right so importancy 
So failure of erection is a feature of parasympathetic plus detrusor failure. Okay, now the choice is sympathetic bladder dysfunction, not classically, more classically is a feature of parasympathetic. Impotency, no impotency, bladder is the predominantly features of parasympathetic. So this is out. Parasympathetic, yes, bladder dysfunction can happen, but not the retrograde ejaculation, which is seen in sympathetic injury. So this is also out. Now third choice is sympathetic. Cutaneous manifestations, okay, can be taken, but impotency, no, that's a feature of parasympathetic, more of a parasympathetic injury. Now sympathetic, bladder dysfunction and retrograde ejaculation. There is most of the students I think must be having confusion between C and D but uh, according to me the best choice should be D. Bladder dysfunction though bladder dysfunction can have many different meanings right. Bladder dysfunction you can take it as just the, the uh, relaxation of detrusor. The bladder is not able to contract but even the failure of internal urethral sphincter is one of the forms of bladder dysfunction. So even with sympathetic injuries, we can see some form of bladder dysfunction and retrograde ejaculation is obviously a feature of the sympathetic injury. So according to me, the best choice is D. So this is all and uh, we have discussed all the questions from surgery in NEET 2023 exam and as we have seen majority of the questions were straightforward, marked questions, most of them from previous year question bank, right? So I hope all of you have done very well and I wish you all the best for the results of this exam. Thank you.